Well, in the presence of the most blessed of all sacraments, truly present our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Holy Tabernacle, and with his kind permission, let us begin this fourth evening conference with a reading from the autobiography of St. Teresa of Jesus, an extraordinary spiritual classic. This holy mystic and spiritual doctor of the church had this to say about good St. Joseph, quote, I took for my advocate the Lord and glorious St. Joseph and commended myself earnestly to him. And I found that this my father and my Lord delivered me both from this trouble and also from other and greater troubles concerning my honor and the loss of my soul. And that he gave me greater blessings than I could ask of him. I do not remember even now that I have ever asked anything of him which he has failed to grant. I am astonished at the great favors which God has bestowed on me through this blessed saint and at the perils from which he has freed me both in body and in soul. She then concludes, To other saints the Lord seems to have given grace to help us in some of our necessities, but of this glorious saint my experience is that he helps us in them all, and that the Lord wishes to teach us that as he was himself subject to him on earth, for being his guardian and being called his father, he could command him, just so in heaven, he still does all that Joseph asks, unquote. In the biography of a very holy nun that was named Sister Catherine, there is made mention of the almighty power present in the Blessed Mother's intercession, her prayers. It seemed that during the lifespan of this holy Sister Catherine, there lived a woman named Mary, who in her youth was a great sinner and who stubbornly persisted in her sinful and evil behaviors even into her very old age. And because of her sinful, publicly sinful, and scandalous behavior, the woman was literally banished from her hometown by her fellow citizens. She was forced to live in a cave beyond the limits of the place and died seemingly in a state of total despair, abandoned by all, even dying without the final sacraments. And on account of her public crimes, which were many, and her lack of acknowledgement and contrition for those crimes, this woman was refused a church burial and was left unburied like a beast. Now this holy Sister Catherine always prayed for the dead and recommended to God the souls of the departed who were in purgatory. But after learning of the miserable death of this poor old woman named Mary, Sister Catherine did not think of praying for her because she and everyone else in the town was convinced that the soul was in hell. But four years went by. And then one night, a soul from purgatory appeared before that holy religious and said, Sister Catherine, Sister Catherine, how unhappy is my fate. You commend to God the souls of all the departed, but for my soul alone you have no pity. Sister Catherine asked, Who are you? The poor soul answered, I am that poor woman named Mary who died in a cave. Sister Catherine responded, Are you saved from the hell fires? The poor soul answered, Yes, I am saved by the mercy of the Virgin Mary. Because when I saw death drawing near, finding myself burdened by all these sins and abandoned by all, I turned to the mother of God and I said to her, Lady, thou art the refuge of all the abandoned. And behold me at this hour deserted by everyone. Thou art my only hope. Thou alone canst help me. And so have pity on me. Intercede for me before your divine son because he cannot say no to your requests. The poor soul then added that the Holy Virgin had obtained a special grace for her that she could make a final act of perfect contrition. 
The departed soul then concluded her visit with Sister Catherine, saying, just a few more masses, just a few more masses only are needed to obtain my release from purgatory. And so I pray thee, cause these masses to be offered. Sister Catherine immediately went to the local parish priest and caused those masses to be offered for the soul of this woman named Mary. But after a few days, that woman again appeared to Sister Catherine. But this time, the woman was shining more brightly than the sun. Mary then said to Sister Catherine, I thank thee, sister. Behold, I am going to paradise to sing of the mercy of God, and I will pray for you. I think we are all aware of Our Lady's wondrous titles, in particular that title, Mediatrix of All Graces. That Our Lady is the chosen channel through which all the waters of God's grace flow to men. Our Lady is the very neck connecting the head, Christ, with the mystical body, the church. She's the ivory tower, as she sometimes called, the neck that connects head and body. She is, as the popes have taught, the dispenser of all the blessings of the Most High. She's not the divine gold that Jesus is, but she is the treasurer that distributes the gold to men. But I would also add that a channel oftentimes flows both ways. The neck connects not just the head and the body, but also the body to the head. In other words, Mary's not just the mediatrix of all the graces that flow down from heaven to men. She is also the mediatrix of all intercessory prayer that is offered upwards to the Son of God. Unlike other saints, her intercessory power is universal. According to God's design and plan, all intercession, all prayers, all sacrifices, all penances of men flow to the good Lord only through the neck of Our Lady. And her all-powerful prayers for men can be especially seen in that mystery we call the Incarnation. God becoming man in Mary's womb. Because consider this, for thousands and thousands of years, men prayed. They wanted that promised child, that promised Messiah to come and to deliver them. And the Jews especially prayed, Rarate Chele, rain down, O heavens, from above, and the clouds send forth the just one, and let the earth be opened and finally bring forth the Savior. Think about it. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all holy men, all holy priests and Levites, many of them, all the holy kings, especially David, the holy leaders like Judas Maccabeus, all of them prayed for the long desire of the nations, come and save us. And yet their prayers were not enough. The prayers were not enough until the prayer for the coming of a Savior issued forth from the lips of the Blessed Mother. Only she was found worthy to receive the Christ. The Immaculate One alone provided that singular, sinless spot on earth. She was the only worthy vessel to receive him. Or some of the saints have called her she is the terrestrial paradise. She is the new Garden of Eden, the only sinless spot to which a new Adam could come. As St. Louis Marie de Montfort, many of you have perhaps read his book, True Devotion. St. Louis Marie de Montfort, the great slave of Our Lady, once wrote, God the Father gave his only Son to the world only through Mary. And so whatever the desires of the patriarchs of old, whatever entreaties the prophets and saints of the old law may have had for 4,000 years to obtain that treasure, it was Mary alone who merited it and found grace before God by the power of her prayers and the perfection of her virtues, unquote. And St. Augustine, great church father, the doctor of grace, 
also confirms this. He says, the world being unworthy to receive the Son of God directly from the hands of the Father, he gave his Son to Mary for the world to receive the Savior through her. Mary's intercessory prayers are all powerful by God's grace. Partly because our dear Lord, in some sense, owes her. There's only one creature ever that in some sense God is indebted to. I mean, we're all debtors to God. We owe him everything, right? But to Mary, God himself is a bit indebted. By listening to his mother and granting all her requests, a saint said, Jesus Christ is only discharging a debt that he owes to his mother. I mean, think about it. Mary provided the opening for the word to become flesh. The Son of God eagerly came into Mary's womb, and she willingly gave him a body to hang upon the cross. She willingly gave him blood in order that he might shed that blood for the sins of men. All that infinite glory that the Son of God gave to his heavenly Father, all those infinite merits, those infinite graces that he gains in his sacred humanity, came through the mystery of the Incarnation. It came through Mary's fiat. Let it be done to me according to thy word. And so the Son of God, by his choice, pays his debt of gratitude by not only giving Mary the ability to dispense all of his graces, but also answering every one of her prayerful requests. And combine this indebtedness that the good Lord has towards his mother with the holiness of Our Lady. And you have the most powerful advocate imaginable before the Most High God. St. Thomas Aquinas, we've mentioned a few times during this mission, the common doctor, the universal doctor that we go to, ite tomos, to find the answers. St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest of all the doctors, teaches the Blessed Virgin Mary's fullness of grace made her of all creatures nearest to the author of grace. What is grace? but a participation in the divine nature, becoming like unto God. And there is no creature that is more like unto God than the Blessed Virgin Mary. God gives grace to those he loves. And he gives the most graces to those he loves the most. And the Heavenly Father's love for the future mother of his Son become flesh was greater than his love for any created person and for all created persons combined. In other words, he loves Our Lady more than any other created person and more than all created persons combined. And therefore, St. Thomas again teaches that her fullness of grace, her life of grace at the time of the Annunciation, when she received that message from the angel Gabriel, the amount of grace that was in her is more than all the grace and all the angels and all the saints combined. In the second letter, or I should say second chapter, of St. John's Holy Gospel, we see the power of Mary's intercession. St. John the Evangelist makes mention of a wedding feast. He says there was a wedding feast at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And as we know, that wedding feast, that time of celebration, was about to become a bust, a disaster. The wine that helped bring life to the party had run dry. The party would be over. The bridegroom, the bride, the parents, the in-laws, all would be ashamed. They couldn't truly throw a feast. And who notices it first? that they've run dry. It is the woman. Women notice a lot of things, very detailed. And Our Lady goes to the only one who can actually do something about it right away. 
She goes to her divine son. She goes to the one who created the heavens and the earth in six days. She goes to the one who literally created the vineyards and all the grapes. Our Lady then simply makes an observation. All that is needed. They have no wine. She drops a little hint. All that's needed. They have no wine. And from this small act of intercession, the blessing of her son will pour down upon that wedding feast. Six stone water jars will be filled with water to the brim, as the Bible states. And as the late great Archbishop Fulton Sheen says, that water will then be brought before its creator and will blush and become wine. But at first, Jesus answered the request of his mother by saying, Woman, how does this concern of yours involve me? And then he adds something, which we've talked about a lot. He says, My hour has not yet come. The Lord has his day. The devil has his hour. My hour has not yet come. In other words, his special hour, the hour of his passion, his death, was seemingly being rushed a bit by this request. My hour hasn't come yet. Because as soon as the Son of God and the Son of Mary performed his first public miracle, his days of hiddenness, his days of peace were over. You start doing miracles, you'll get disciples and they'll believe in you. You'll have people following you. You'll become even a celebrity. And also you'll get your detractors. You'll get your enemies as well. Again, the hour that our Lord was speaking about was the hour of his passion and death. The hour that the devil would be allowed to be unleashed and to wreak havoc until the day of the Lord. Yet to satisfy his mother, he changed the water into the best wine that has ever been tasted by the lips of men. According to the divine plan of Almighty God, it would be Our Lady who would choose the hour. That was the decree, obviously. She would be the one who would choose the hour, the beginning of his hour, the beginning of his public miracles, and his beginning to see Calvary in the distance knowing full well, and she knew it, this being the feast of the Servites, those Servite founders, today's feast, February 11th, the ones who have great devotion to the sorrows of our Blessed Mother. She heard those words of Simeon, the old man that held our Lord in his hands as an infant, who said, a sword of sorrow will pierce your heart. Our Lady knew exactly what this public miracle would bring about. She knew that it would be the beginning of that walk towards death. She knew that her son was born as a man in order to die. And that this would be the beginning of that journey to Calvary. But knowing full well the dangers that lay ahead for her divine son, Our Lady was willing to sacrifice all. Why? To help the helpless. For this bride and bridegroom. She was willing to begin that road to Calvary at Cana for the sake of those who had a need, even just a material need. The time for miracles had not yet arrived. Nevertheless, from all eternity, the Son of God had established that decree that if she started the hour, he would say yes. St. Thomas Aquinas, again, the greatest of theologians and philosophers in history, comments on that expression, my hour has not yet come. St. Thomas teaches, here Christ wished to indicate that if anyone else had asked for that miracle at Cana, he would not have granted it. Anyone else could have asked, and it would not have been granted. But since it was his mother who asked, he performed it. 
Therefore, Our Lady is omnipotent in regards to her intercessory prayers. For no request was denied her on earth, and no request of hers is denied by her son while she reigns in heaven as queen. Her intercession is even more powerful in heaven than it ever was on earth. It is certainly true that the Son of God has supreme dominion over all creation. Mary is just a creature. She is she who is not in comparison to he who is. But at the same time, it can be said that the second person of the Trinity was pleased to humble himself and to be subject to both our Blessed Mother in terms of her requests and commands. St. Alphonsus Liguori makes an extraordinary statement. The great Marian doctor, St. Alphonsus, states, at the command of Mary, all obey, even God. At the command of Mary, all obey, even God. St. Alphonsus adds this about Mary's intercessory power. Mary became omnipotent because Jesus is omnipotent. Of course, the Son, he continues, is all-powerful by nature. Literally, the Son of God by nature. But Mary is all-powerful by God's grace, by his favor. This is proved by the fact that the Son never refuses the mother anything she seeks. I think to St. Bridget of Sweden, another wonderful mystic of old, she learned this in a revelation. One day, St. Bridget of Sweden heard Jesus saying to Mary, Ask me for anything. Your request can never be in vain. And this is the beautiful reason he gave. Because you, Mother, never refused me anything on earth. Therefore, I will refuse you nothing in heaven. No wonder then that Satan himself was forced to admit during one exorcism, forced to admit that a single sigh from Mary is worth more in God's eyes than all the prayers of all the angels and the saints combined. Just a sigh, just a hint, they have no wine, that's all it took. If you were to read the Holy Gospels, all four of them, you will never find one passage not even a hint of Our Lady ever being harsh or condemning towards anyone. She is not the divine justice. She's not the judge. That is Jesus alone. But she is, as the litany states, the mirror of justice, just the reflection of justice. Therefore, none of us, no matter our sinful condition, should ever be afraid to approach her and ask for her powerful prayers to obtain grace and forgiveness. Mary is the helper of the helpless, and we are helpless without her. Remember what she said to the three children at Fatima? She would even speak of herself in the third person. She's speaking to the three children, and she says, Only she can help you, referring to herself. Only she can help you. She's the helper of the helpless. She is the refuge of sinners, again, as the litany tells us. She is a home for the abandoned. She is the hope for the most miserable. And she is the all-powerful advocate for every sinner who turns to her. St. Bonaventure, and then again another doctor of the church, once stated, Mary cares for all, even sinners. She will never fail us. Her requests, even her hints towards the Divine Son, are immediately granted. And so we would be in a very bad situation indeed, sinners that we are, if we did not have this great advocate who was so powerful in her intercession and merciful. She's so prudent and she's so wise that the judge, her son, cannot condemn the guilty when she defends them. If you have her as a lawyer above at judgment, she will always win the case. This is exactly what Mary is always doing in heaven for countless sinners on earth. She knows so well how to appease the divine wrath, the justice of God, 
and her tender and, yes, compelling prayers that God blesses her for it. Thank you, Mother. And he, she, and he thanks her for stopping him when he might abandon sinners and punish them as they truly deserve. And you might say, this sounds way too much, Father. How often is God trying to draw out from his creatures intercessory prayer for those in need of being forgiven? How often did he tell Moses, for example, you know, Moses, these Israelites you're dealing with, they're, they're terrible. They're not my people, they're your people. And Moses would say, well, come on, let, 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 let's stick with these people. Have mercy on these people. You brought them out of Egypt, let's bring them to the Holy Land. He wanted that from Moses. He loves bringing out that prayerfulness for intercession. What about Abraham, right? Another Old Testament saint, not even close to Mary in regards to holiness. But Abraham, when it came to that those cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, and, and of course, God's I'm going to destroy those cities. I'm going to send angels down there, destroy them. And Abraham begins to bargain. God loves bargainers. Well, how about, how about if you can find, let's say, 50 people there who are who are not evil like the rest of the inhabitants? Would you would you not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah then? Yeah, I'll, 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 I won't destroy it then. What about 40? What if you find 30? What if you find 15? He starts bargaining down and down, looking for, for the mercy upon these people. God loves to have intercessory prayer. We don't know how powerful it is when the saints pray and intercede for us, especially Mary interceding for us. Even if we have fallen into mortal sin, even if we have a habitual, chronic, regular mortal sin that it that it is clinging to us, even if we have one foot in hell itself, a sincere appeal to Our Lady never goes unheard and never goes unanswered. And so it's most appropriate that the good Lord would provide the most special guardian for his most faithful mother, that he would provide the best husband ever for his mother. Sometimes we use that phrase if, in defending the Immaculate Conception, if you could make your own mother, <laughs> wouldn't you make her perfect? Well, God can make his own mother, and he did, and he made her perfect. Well, if you could make your own foster father, if you can create a husband for this mother you love so much, wouldn't you make him perfect too? And of course, he can do all that. Now, tradition tells us that Saints Joachim and Anne were the true parents of the Blessed Mother. When Our Lady was just three years of age, Joachim and Anne presented her in the temple. It's that November feast, right? November 21st, presentation of Our Lady in the temple. In other words, Joachim and Anne allowed their immaculate daughter to remain in God's house as a temple virgin dedicated to the service of the Almighty. But when Mary and other temple virgins had reached the age of womanhood, as was the custom, the high priest Zechariah announced that it was time for all the women to return home so that marriages could be arranged for them. That was the normal course of things. But Our Lady stated that she could not do this since her parents had dedicated her to the service of the Lord and that she had made a vow a perpetual virginity to the Most High. And so having heard Mary's plea, the high priest took this to prayer to see what to do. And after a time of discernment, Zechariah, the high priest, received an answer from above. The high priest told Mary, that he had been instructed by an angel to bring together the marriageable men and to have each of them leave his wooden staff in the temple overnight. And the high priest followed the angel's directions and called for all the men of the house of David who had not yet taken a wife to come forward. The high priest had instructed them to come to the temple, bring their staffs with them, and to leave it near the altar. And it had been revealed to the high priest that one of those staffs, the chosen staff of one man, would miraculously blossom with flowers. 
just perhaps like Aaron's staff, blossom of flowers in the Old Testament. And furthermore, the Holy Ghost, in the form of a dove, would land on that flowering staff to confirm that the man who owned this staff was to be the husband of Our Lady. And these signs did point out the perfect spouse, because good St. Joseph's staff alone flowered and had the dove land upon it. This is why good St. Joseph is always pictured, always pictured, it seems, with the flowering staff, the chosen one of God, by eternal decree. We've been praying each evening that wonderful prayer that honors the three hearts, the three hearts. We have the sacred heart that we focused in on for centuries, to the apparitions especially of St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, and of course, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, we've had a devotion to her, but what about that heart of Joseph? The church needs to embrace that devotion more and more. Heart of Jesus, I adore thee. Heart of Mary, I implore thee. Heart of Joseph, pure and just. In these three hearts, these trinity of hearts, I place my trust. These hearts are inseparable. I remember a great... Marian St. St. John Eudes, you might have heard of him before. St. John Eudes, when he would sign his letters, his correspondence, he would say, in the heart of Jesus and Mary. That's how he would sign his letters at the end. Note the, the use of the singular, in the heart of Jesus and Mary. Well, I would say, well, let's add another, in the heart of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. There's one ultimate heart. It's the heart of Christ. And that heart is shared. That heart, that love, that mercy, that goodness is shared with those who have membership and grace within the mystical body. We must acknowledge the heart of Joseph. Now, obviously, good St. Joseph and his pure heart do not receive adoration like the heart of the Son of God. Nor does the pure heart of Joseph receive that special singular veneration due to Our Lady alone. That veneration known as hyperdulia, fancy word, Greek word, to show that she has a singular special devotion owed to no other saint. But Joseph is given a special veneration and honor too. We call it protodulia. Another Greek term meaning, meaning first honor. He receives first honor after Our Lady. Therefore, St. Joseph in his pure heart is seated on a throne higher than any other than that of Jesus and Mary. That's why Pope Leo XIII of Holy Memory taught the following, quote, The dignity of the Mother of God is certainly so sublime that nothing can surpass it. But nonetheless, since the bond of marriage existed between Joseph and the Blessed Virgin, there can be no doubt that more than any other person, Joseph approached the supereminent dignity by which the Mother of God is raised above all created natures. He is the closest to Our Lady, the closest to his foster son in heaven. It's a basic fact, a basic fact that the good Lord gives special graces to special people. If a man has a higher mission, a higher duty or office in life, in the plan of God, then he will receive graces to complete that mission. Our Lady, as the Mother of God, had the most important mission of all. The most important mission of any created person, and therefore she was given the most grace of any other person. But after her, the mission or office, the duty in God's plan that was most important was that to, given to St. Joseph. He's got to be a father figure to the Christ child. He's got to be a guardian and head of the Holy Family. He has to be a husband for the most important woman ever. As Mary was from eternity predestined to be the mother of God, one saint put it, so also Joseph was elected to be the guardian and protector of Jesus and of Mary. From all eternity, that the woman Mary was chosen to be the mother 
And from all eternity, Joseph was to be the one chosen to be the husband of Mary and the foster father to the Christ child. See, St. Joseph is part of that hypostatic order. Big word. Remember the hypostatic union. That is the union of the two natures of Christ. His divine nature and his human nature. They're brought together in one divine person. The second person of the Holy Trinity. That's what they call the hypostatic union. The union of the two natures in one person. That's called the hypostatic order. And those closest to that mystery are the highest saints of all. That puts Joseph far above the apostolic order. He's far above St. Peter, far above St. Paul, far above all the apostles, in fact. And we need to recognize his privileges. First, St. Joseph was born without any stain of original sin. He was sanctified in the womb of his mother. In fact, it is rightly thought that he was put into the state of sanctifying grace immediately after his conception, so that that devil would quickly lose whatever grip he had on the unborn Joseph. Combine this with the fact that he never committed any actual personal sin. Combine that further, that he was given the privilege of not suffering from what most of us suffer from, namely concupiscence, disordered desires regarding the flesh and material goods, greed, lust, anger that's out of control. Not for Joseph. Furthermore, good St. Joseph was prepared for his preeminent role by his virginal purity. Again, I refer to that venerable Mary of Agrita, the mystical city of God that she wrote. Miss Venerable Mary of Agrita writes, from his 12th year, just 12 years old, he had made and kept a vow of perfect chastity and was known for the utmost purity of his life. And again, as I mentioned last night, how sick and tired we should be of the claim that Joseph was some old guy, a widower, a widower who had supposedly tasted the lights of the flesh, brought forth many children, and was now worn out with age. Let us not fall prey to this error, even if it was put forward as a way to protect Mary's perpetual virginity. No, Joseph was young. He was virile. He was a man of marriageable age. He was a worker, a laborer, not a retiree. And he chose to make a vow of virginity. And he sacrificed in making that vow. According to the will of God, who caused that staff of Joseph to flower, to blossom, thus manifesting his chosen place in the mission, this virginal spouse would take Our Lady for a wife. It would not be right that the Blessed Virgin would, be, would come, would become with child without a proper husband. Again, for those who even suggest that Our Lady was some sort of single mother, what a blasphemy. She's a married woman. Joseph would be her husband. You see, if the conception, the miraculous conception and birth of Jesus were to happen, then the devil would have to be confused and distracted. See, Satan knows the scriptures. He knows them forwards and backwards. Remember, he is an angel, albeit fallen. And he's looking for a virgin. He knows how the Messiah is going to come into this world through a virgin. And he found one, he thought, in Our Lady. Oh, she was good. She was holy. No exterior temptation affected her at all. She was sinless. And she was beautiful. And she was a virgin. This is the one, he thought. This is the one. But when Joseph appeared on the scene and took her as a wife, the devil moved on to other options. Because he wrongly thought that a married woman could never be the virgin that would bring forth the Messiah. St. Joseph then would become a real father to the Christ child, if not in a physical sense, in every other sense. 
In fact, many saintly men have suggested, and this is extraordinary, many saintly men have stated that in forming the perfect flesh of Christ from the most pure blood of the Virgin, the Holy Ghost made sure that there was at least some physical resemblance to Joseph in the Christ child, lest there be any false charge of infidelity. And so all the relatives looking at the child would naturally think that Jesus was the son of Joseph the carpenter. Good Saint Joseph would then complete his wondrous mission perfectly, again without committing any actual sins by the grace of God, and after his most holy death, a death that was extraordinary to say the least, where Jesus and Mary held him and blessed him in his last agony. And after a time spent in a limbo with the limbo of the fathers, telling them that the Messiah had been born and was on his mission of redemption, good St. Joseph will be raised from the dead into glory. During our Lord's passion and resurrection, you've read the Bible, you know that many bodies raised from the dead and walked around witnessing to the resurrection. And one of them was Joseph. And that body was assumed into heavenly glory. St. Bernard of Siena, St. Francis of the Sales, so many doctors speak of it. St. Bernard of Siena writes, In the same way that Mary was assumed into heaven... It is thought that Jesus deigned to glorify Joseph. In this way, all the Holy Family, it makes so much sense, all the Holy Family, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, who lived together on earth, would reign together in heaven. St. Joseph would receive the completion of redemption, not just redeemed in soul, but fully redeemed already in body. And so knowing the great privileges and graces granted to good St. Joseph, it is obvious that he, like Our Lady, must be powerful in his intercessory prayer. No wonder then that his power before the throne of the Son of God is compared to the power of the Old Testament Joseph before the throne of Pharaoh. We've already made that connection. Joseph of the Old Testament being a prefigurement, a type of the Joseph of the New Testament. And so in the Old Testament, the historic book of Genesis to be exact, it is said that Egypt experienced a great famine. When people cried to help, the Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, don't come to me, ite ad Joseph, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. Today the world is experiencing a great moral spiritual famine. And so the church and her popes have told us, Ite ad Joseph, go to Joseph. Go to the New Testament Joseph. Go to the greatest of all patriarchs for relief and strength. And there is no doubt that devotion to St. Joseph has been steadily gaining momentum for hundreds of years. This is a sign that Our Lady's triumph of her Immaculate Heart is getting nearer because this is the condition. She wants her husband honored publicly as he ought to be. It's a sign of the end times, to be honest with you. One of the end times signs is that his tomb, empty, will be found. He is part of the end times, an important element, in fact. God the Father had confided to St. Joseph his greatest treasures of all. His only son was put into the responsible hands of Joseph. And yes, the most beautiful woman ever was put into Joseph's guardianship as well. And he became the head of the Holy Family and master of the Lord's house. He gave St. Joseph authority over his only begotten son, and he gave the authority of a husband over his wife to St. Joseph. And what a beautiful family this would have been because there was never a more obedient son and never more a submissive wife. What an example of that holy family at Nazareth. And we must not imagine that somehow these 
glorious duties and offices held by St. Joseph on earth are now somehow forgotten or disregarded in heaven. There is no doubt that Joseph in heaven has an unlimited power of intercession. For example, we knew already Our Lady. She approaches her divine son in heaven not so much as a beggar pleading. She's a queen. She lovingly insists before her son for the needs of men. And St. Joseph too, according to the saints, intercedes for men not so much begging, but almost as if it were a commandment to both his spouse and to his foster son. How could Mary deny such a husband? How could Jesus deny such a man whom he called father every day of his life on earth? And furthermore, those teachers of the faith tell us that while many saints are called upon for particular needs, St. Christopher, help me to arrive safely on a journey. St. Anthony, I'm lost something, help find it. St. Joseph, every need, universal intercession for any need in body and soul. So let's face it, the Son of God never refused Joseph anything on earth, and he refuses Joseph nothing in heaven. As a final note to end this mission conference on the all-powerful intercession of Our Lady and Joseph. I want you to consider a holy religious brother whom perhaps many of you have read about, Blessed Andre Bisset, the man who gave us the great basilica in Montreal known as St. Joseph Oratory. He grew up, Blessed Andre Bisset, in a working-class home with nine siblings, when Blessed Andre was very young, he lost his father, crushed to death by a fallen tree. By 12, he also lost his mother to tuberculosis. And eventually he worked in many different jobs, a cobbler, a blacksmith, a handyman. But even with the full day's work, Blessed Andre always found time to pray the Holy Rosary, to do a daily stations of the cross. And yes, a regular visit before a statue of St. Joseph, the very patron of all of Canada. When the pastor eventually convinced him to become a religious, to become a, a religious brother, he dropped off Blessed Andre at the novitiate house and he said to the superiors, I am sending you a saint for your community. And as a new religious, Blessed Andre was appointed a porter, a doorkeeper. And though he was often sick in those first years of his religious life, the local bishop would allow him to take his religious vows. And why? Because Blessed Andre said to the bishop, I have a dream to build a shrine in honor of St. Joseph. His task as a doorkeeper, a porter, was not easy. Someone was constantly ringing the bell. Blessed Andre would then take the visitors in, brought them into a parlor to sit and wait, and then he would run into the institution to find the priest or student that was being requested to see. Sometimes he was snubbed by the person who requested to see someone that wasn't available. Sometimes the visitors would slam the door in his face. In the evening, when all the come and go had stopped and there was quiet, he would then get on his knees and he would begin to wash and polish and wax the floor of the institution, always by the dim light of a candle. Blessed Andre also did the laundry. He acted as the barber, the infirmarian. But having finished all his work, he always had time to slip into that chapel and to pray before a statue of good St. Joseph. And after about 15 years of this laborious, hidden life, Brother Andre received from the foster father of Jesus the grace to perform countless miracles. One night, when he was at the bedside of a sick student with diphtheria, which seriously obstructed 
the boy's throat, Brother Andre received an inspiration. Silently he went to the chapel, he grabbed a St. Joseph medal, and he returned upstairs. The student stated, My brother, why did you leave me? I am suffering so very much. Brother Andre replied, You're not going to suffer anymore. And so he took that metal of St. Joseph and began to rub the boy's throat and began to pray to St. Joseph. And the sick boy dozed off. And early the next morning, the boy awoke and exclaimed, My brother, I am cured. And indeed that morning was confirmed that no trace of illness remained. And after a few more wondrous cures, Rumors of miracles performed by Brother Andre spread through all of Montreal. And the sick came to him running, hoping to be cured. Soon the crowds were such that Brother Andre's superiors became concerned. And they forbid, they forbid any more healing, no more seeing the sick. But the Cardinal Archbishop of Montreal intervened with the superiors. The Archbishop asked the superiors, about Brother Andre, saying, If you told Brother Andre not to receive the sick anymore, would he obey that command? Certainly, said the superiors. And the archbishop stated, Then let him do it. If the work is from God, it will develop. If not, it will collapse on its own. And so the stream of sick people continued to come to see Brother Andre to such an extent that the city of Montreal had to put in a whole new trolley line just for those traveling to see Brother Andre. But though he cured men in their bodies, Brother Andre was most concerned for the salvation of their souls. He asserted to a sick man who came to see him, If you want St. Joseph to cure you, leave the woman you're living with in fornication, then come back and see me. To another he said, You will have to go to confession, and you will begin a novena to St. Joseph, and then you will be cured. Go to confession, said the sick man. How could I? It's been 25 years since I went to confession. But I will do it. I promise to do it. And yes, that man was cured as well. And Brother Andre did eventually begin that promised project of a shrine in honor of Joseph. And by the year 1931, the Oratory of St. Joseph had wonderful walls, thick, wonderful walls. But money ran out before they could put on a roof. Brother Andre then stated to the workers, put a statue of St. Joseph in the open, exposed to the weather. If he wants a roof over his head, he'll get it. And that roof came. The completion of St. Joseph's Oratory Basilica occupied his thoughts because he was aware of all the good that St. Joseph accomplished. He told his superior, You don't know how much good God is doing through St. Joseph at the Oratory. What terrible things there are in the world. I was in the position to see that. If only people loved God, they would never sin. Everything would go perfectly if they loved God as he loves them. Brother Andre would never see the completed church. He was hospitalized with acute gastritis. And on a Wednesday, which is always St. Joseph's Day, on a Wednesday, January 6th, the Epiphany, 1937, Brother Andre rendered his soul to God and entered into eternal life. Now he reigns in heaven with St. Joseph, doing even more good than he ever accomplished on earth. Heart of Jesus, we adore thee. Heart of Mary, we implore thee. Heart of Joseph, pure and just. In these three hearts, we place our trust. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. On well, the presence of our dearest Lord, truly present in the most blessed of all sacraments, his body, blood, soul, and divinity, and knowing that we will receive his blessing at the very end of this conference, and with his kind permission, 
I'd like to begin this conference, this final conference of our parish mission on St. Joseph by having a reading from the historical book, the inerrant book of Genesis. And again, Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, I have appointed thee over the whole land of Egypt. And he took his ring from his own hand, and he gave it into his hand, and he put upon him a robe of silk, and put a chain of gold around his neck. And he made him go into his second chariot, the crier proclaiming that all should bow their knee before Joseph, and that they should know he was made governor over the whole land of Egypt. And the king said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. Without thy commandment, no man shall move hand or foot in the land of Egypt. And he turned Joseph's name and called him in the Egyptian tongue, the savior of the world. And a famine prevailed in the whole world, and there was bread in all the land of Egypt. And when they began to be famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. And he said to them, Go to Joseph and do all that he shall say to you. And the famine increased daily in all the land, and Joseph opened up all the barns and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine had oppressed them also. And all the provinces came to Egypt to buy food and to seek some relief from their want. Again, words taken from the historical and an errant book of Genesis. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost. Amen. We'll begin with St. Juliana of Liege. She was born in the year 1193 A.D. And from her early childhood, St. Juliana had a special devotion to the most blessed of all sacraments, the Holy Eucharist. She eventually became a consecrated nun. She meditated constantly upon the Holy Eucharist. And one day, when she was just 16 years old, she began to have visions. And in one particular vision, St. Juliana saw the moon in the sky, a full moon in the sky, hanging in midair. And although the moon was shining very, very brightly, there was one single black spot upon the moon. She thought that her vision might have just been her imagination, and so she tried to forget about it and just do her prayers. The vision came back again and again until she realized that it must be from the good Lord. And so, properly, St. Juliana told her superior, who also became confused as to the meaning of this vision of a moon with a black spot. Frustrated, St. Juliana spent many days in prayer until our good Lord explained this mysterious vision to her. Our Lord said to Juliana, I desire to set up a special feast for my church militant, because this feast is most necessary. Our dear Lord then continued, It is a feast of the most high and most holy sacrament of the altar. Unquote. And furthermore, our dearest Lord told St. Juliana that this vision of the moon was a symbol of the church, so bright with all of its liturgical feasts, the black part, the black spot in the moon, meant that there was no feast in honor of the most blessed sacrament in a special way. He gave her the mission to get as many people as possible interested in this new feast in honor of the Holy Eucharist. And after many years of uncertainty and a lot of struggle, as well as a wondrous Eucharistic miracle, our Lord's request for a feast would be fulfilled. With that solemn liturgy that we all know of, Corpus Christi, celebrated every year on a Thursday after Trinity Sunday. We know that St. Thomas Aquinas, the greatest philosopher and theologian in the history of the church, would eventually put together some of the most beautiful chants in the history of Gregorian chant for the Mass and the office of Corpus Christi, the O Salutaris, the Tantum Ergo, the Panis Angelicus, the O Sacrum Convivium, and of course the famous sequence, the Laudazion. The moon of the church 
and her calendar would now shine forth more brightly than ever with solemn rituals, pious devotions, and yes, holy processions connected with Corpus Christi. But with all the many drastic, and that's not an overstatement, with all the many drastic changes in the liturgy over the past few decades, the festive and, yes, bright moon of the church began to wane. In fact, I would suggest that there has been a near lunar eclipse due to the unprecedented destruction of the Roman Rite and the introduction of the Novus Ordo Mise. You see, the new Mass, which was introduced in Advent of 1969, was not simply a restoration or a renovation of the ancient Mass of Rome, not just a touch-up here and there, but rather an entirely new ritual for a new modern age. And this, again, is not an overstatement, since the very authors of the new Mass admit as much, calling it a new creation. Archbishop Bugnini, you may have read about him in some of your reading, a main figure in composing the modern rite of the Mass, certainly stated the following, quote, It is not simply a question of restoring a valuable masterpiece. We're not taking an old painting and sort of cleaning it or maybe touching up the frame here and there. No, in some cases, it will be necessary to provide new structures for entire new rites. And then he added, it is truly a new creation. Other influential members of this particular group that composed the Nova Sordo Mise added, to tell you the truth, it's a different liturgy of the Mass with an entirely new foundation of Eucharistic theology and whose ecumenical requirements are in harmony with the Church's new positions. Yet another cleric who was on that committee that composed the new rituals in an unguarded moment clearly stated, this needs to be said without confusion. The Roman rite as we know it no longer exists. And finally, the individual who actually approved this new ritual, this new liturgy, namely Pope Paul VI, openly admitted, quote, there is now a new rite of Mass, a change and a venerable tradition that has gone on for centuries. This is something that affects our religious and hereditary patrimony, which seemed, he adds, to enjoy the privilege of being untouchable and settled, unquote. To paraphrase a commentary written by Cardinal Ratzinger back in the day, before he became Pope and now Pope Emeritus, Benedict, he said, we now have a non-organic, fabricated, artificial, and on-the-spot product invented by a liturgy committee. And as a result, we do have a very dark shadow over the bright moon of the church's worship in the Latin rites. You know, in centuries past, some Protestant revolutionaries with a real puritanical zeal sought the wholesale abandonment of all ritual and liturgy as well as the destruction, the removal of altars, statues, sacred vessels, investments. History repeated itself, at least in part, as the new Mass became impoverished, liturgically speaking, and modern parishes saw various iconoclasts tear out the old and bring in the new. And as a result of this destruction, the wondrous beauty, the order, the formality, within our rituals and church buildings, was largely lost. A traditional author of note has gone so far as to label this the heresy of formlessness. The error of formlessness. And as a result of this destruction, we have a formlessness around us where transcendence, God being so far above us, is now replaced by the worldly, where the elevated is brought down to earth, where mysterious veils are completely removed, where sacred languages for worship are replaced 
by more vulgar or common words, where soaring ceilings become dropped ceilings, where chant changes into hootenanny music, where ugliness reigns, while beauty, order, and ritual are disdained, where outward forms, ritual, and symbolism are disdained and seen as merely superfluous or too showy. The stripped down is what we want. The impoverished is seen as more real, man. End the ritualistic, and let's have it replaced by the simplistic. Let's have it replaced by the minimal, the least we can do for God. But thanks be to God, the traditional Latin Mass survived through it all this assault of formlessness. The transcendent, the sacred, and the mysterious are maintained in the older rituals with its formalities, with its ritual, with its beauty and order. And because form and structure is kept, the content of the faith is kept, along with its mystical significance. There is such richness in the old mass, just in the very movements and gestures. In fact, all the mysteries of our salvation in Christ find expression in the traditional Latin mass. And with this in mind, I would like to go through in a very abbreviated way these symbolic meanings to the rituals of the ancient mass that somehow through the visible we will see in some way or understand the invisible realities and to insist me in this regard, I'll be referring to a very pious and short little book simply called Following Christ Through the Mass, written in 1935. We know the priest begins Holy Mass, those special prayers at the foot of the altar, including the Confitior. We must consider that moment the fall of man. The priest stands at a distance from the altar. And he bows in public profession of guilt, even striking his breast. We're members of the race of Adam, a fallen race driven out of paradise due to original sin, and we ought to show contrition. The kissing of the altar follows, along with the relic that is within, and it demonstrates both our confidence in Christ and our greeting of Christ, represented by the altar, as well as greeting the saints whose remains, whose relics are within. And as Mass begins with the recitation of the introit, that opening antiphon, we should ponder the beginning of our very salvation with the Incarnation. And we should think of the Son of God becoming man in Mary's womb at that moment. And from there the Kyrie is sung, where the cries of Adam's children rise up, begging for mercy, forgiveness, all about the Gloria which brings to our lips the very words of angels which they spoke to the shepherds to draw them to Bethlehem. The sign of the cross then ends this angelic hymn of the Gloria because this divine infant will suffer, forced to flee to Egypt to escape the evil King Herod, and yes, eventually crucified upon the cross. The mysteries of Christ continue in the Mass, with that major opening prayer known as the Collect, where the collection of all the children's prayers are gathered together by church, Holy Mother Church, and then given a powerful and hopefully pleading voice by the priest. Next follows the lesson, the epistle, the mass, and the epistles always said facing towards the east, facing towards the direction of the rising sun and salvation. But soon afterwards, the positioning of that book is changed. The Roman Missal is changed from one side of the altar to the other, the gospel side, demonstrating that the Jews, by and large, will reject the preaching of Christ, compelling Christ's apostles to bring the gospel over to the pagans. And when that Missal, that Roman Missal, reaches that other side, we rise. From our sitting position... For the gospel has wrought miracles where men crippled now walk, 
where dead men in graves are raised to life. And note, too, that when that book does arrive on the gospel side, it is slightly put at an angle. So it's not facing east, but actually facing in a northern direction. And that northern direction marks something. The north always marked the devil's throne where he reigned as prince of the world. Because what was north of Rome? That's where the pagans lived, the barbarians. That's where the vandals, the Lombards, various tribes lived that were in darkness. And yes, north of Rome can be cured by the light of the gospel of Christ. And so we preach in that direction. And on important liturgical days like Sunday or the Feast of the Apostles, we have the Creed recited next. Because although the gospel has been preached and the Holy Ghost has renewed the face of the earth, there's always heresies. Heretics who arise that need to be defeated by the profession of the true faith during the Creed. The Offertory. And what beautiful Offertory prayers the Old Mass has. Such beautiful prayers of the offertory. They call it the little canon. The anticipation of the sacrifice is already made known. Not just Jewish meal prayers, but sacrificial prayers being offered up at the offertory. And it marks the time of the Last Supper in the life of Christ, where the Savior shared that final meal with his apostles. And with the bread having been offered up, the chalice then filled with wine, is mixed with just a drop or two of water. The wine, of course, symbolizes the true vine. Christ is the true vine who gives life to the branches, but the water represents frail humanity. But the mixture of the two is a vivid reminder of the wondrous exchange between divinity and humanity, a wonderful union of the bridegroom with the bride, the Savior and his one church. The washing of the hands then follows, obviously taking us back to that moment known as the mandatum, where Christ washed the feet of his apostles. For those who come to the sacrificial banquet of the Mass have to have an interior cleansing. They must be free from mortal sin. And when the priest returns to the center of the altar, he kisses it always recognizing the altar as symbolizing Christ. And he turns towards the church, towards the faithful. And he says, Orate fratres, pray, brethren. And according to the church doctor and that wondrous Franciscan St. Bonaventure, that phrase, pray, brethren, reminds one of the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane, telling his brothers, telling his apostles to watch and to pray for him and with him, if only for an hour. The preface, which soon follows, is a time that we lift up our hearts. For Christ will soon gain victory despite all the blasphemies, all the insults, all the mockeries he faces. But as the priest finishes that long preface, he soon realizes that his voice is weakened. It's become insignificant in the presence of such holiness and this causes him to call upon the saints. As the saints and the angels recite Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus. Then the Hosannas come. The Hosannas and the Benedictus qui vene, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, reminds us of our Lord entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, thus beginning his path towards Calvary and his passion. A most awesome moment then arrives when the priest recites the Roman canon in silence. For silence is a figure of the fearful and timid apostles, as well as the meekness of Christ, who was, as the Bible says, silent as a lamb before his shearer. But that silence will then be broken just seven more times until the end of the Holy Mass to mark the seven last phrases of Christ, which he spoke on Good Friday upon the Holy Cross. And at the elevation of the sacred host, Christ the victim, we should think of his being lifted up upon that Holy Cross. 
And when that chalice is raised up, we should see it placed at the very feet of Christ to catch the drops that shed forth from him, his precious blood. And all those genuflections, so many genuflections in the old mass, it's demanded by the rubrics. They're not superfluous. They mean something. They become not just acts of adoration, but also acts of reparation for those who once knelt before him in mockery and contempt. All the mysteries of Christ, including his resurrection and ascension, come forth from the Mass. A small piece of the consecrated host is commingled with the chalice and the precious blood marking the reunion, a reunion of his body and soul, the glorified body and soul. And eventually we come to that ite, misa est, recalling our Lord's commission to the apostles to baptize and to preach before he ascended up to heaven. And lastly, the final blessing. At the Holy Mass, according to many saints, represents the descent of the Holy Ghost, which strengthens the apostles to preach to the nations. And yes, it prepares us to preach the last gospel at every single Mass, to defend the truth of the Incarnation. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that Word became flesh and dwelt among us every Mass, reminding us of that central teaching of Christ's divinity and his true humanity. There is nothing superfluous, as the Council of Trent taught, regarding the Roman Mass. It's not a mere show. So we shouldn't see it as some of the modernists would tell us, oh, it's pure ritualism, as if that's something evil. I recently read an article by a good traditional Catholic about the Old Mass. In short, the author was speaking about those Catholics who simply prefer the Old Mass, as if it were just a preference or more favorable ritual for them, or even just a current fashion for them. Maybe a fad that they kind of like for a little bit. Perhaps some prefer the old mass simply because oftentimes the music's better. Or perhaps there's more reverence, greater solemnity, or perhaps they like the silence. Or the fact that they can avoid perhaps the craziness that might be present in some parish nearby. The author makes an important point. This is not about preference, but rather about necessity. This is about properly expressing and, yes, keeping the traditional Catholic faith. The traditional Latin Mass is the Mass of Rome. This is the ancient Mass of Rome, and it is the Mass of the Martyrs. The Old Mass is the most ancient of all the rites of the Church. The Mass of Rome is the ancient rite, more ancient than all others, and it protects the Holy Faith. This is the Mass of the Saints. This is the Mass that St. Francis served as deacon at. This is the Mass that St. Teresa of Jesus prayed at. This is the Mass that St. Catherine of Siena was devoted to. This is the Mass that Pope St. Gregory the Great would be very familiar with. This is the Mass of Rome. And its Catholicity, its pedigree, is unblemished. Therefore, for me, I don't have a preference for this Mass, but rather I have an obligation, a necessary obligation to offer this permanently in my life. And when one looks at good St. Joseph, one sees his life and his death as it were a mass. His life and death is a mass, complete with a true sacrifice, a true passion, as well as Joseph having a daily communion with the bread of life. As I mentioned in the first evening of this parish mission, St. Joseph experienced his own passion, his own Good Friday, his own Gethsemane, his own agony in the garden. 
we often speak about Our Lady of Sorrows, the seven sorrows of Mary, and rightly so. But what about Joseph as a man of sorrows, who was called to unite with the passion and death of Christ, though he died well before Jesus' journey up Calvary? Before we consider the passion of Joseph further, first realize that since he is the greatest saint in heaven after Our Lady, he has the third most tender heart in all of creation. Our Lord's sacred heart is tenderness itself. Then comes the immaculate heart of Mary, followed by the pure and just heart of Joseph. Those three tender hearts. Tender in that they're vulnerable. They're susceptible to great suffering. And the more innocent and the more pure a heart seems to be in God's plan, the more it seems open to great suffering. All the world's sins landed upon the tender hearts of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. And how is it that the heart of Joseph suffered, even though he wasn't at Calvary? We can think of his struggle early on, when he discovered a child, literally in the womb, of his wife. Although he loved his spouse beyond telling, St. Joseph had to be responsible. He had to separate from her since he felt himself unworthy to be in the presence of the Ark of the New Covenant. Joseph had absolutely no doubt about the virginity and purity of his wife. But he realized that his wife was God's chosen vessel. She was divine property, and he was not worthy to be in the midst of the spouse of the Holy Ghost. And this planned separation caused him great pain. That is, until the angel assured Joseph to take Mary as his spouse. Consider, too, that men suffer, and they suffer a lot, in relation to their responsibilities. And so before there was the mystery of the finding of Jesus in the temple, a joyful mystery, there was the loss of Jesus in the temple. That was a mystery, the mystery of the loss of Jesus. Though Mary and Joseph could never lose the good Lord spiritually, as they were both confirmed and fixed in the state of grace, they could suffer the loss of Jesus physically. And note that when Jesus is found three days later, Our Lady mentions Joseph first when speaking to her son. Our Lady said, and seeing Jesus, they wondered, and his mother said to him, Son, why hast thou done so to us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Remember one time when a person asked me about this passage, and this person said to me, What's the big deal? I mean, losing Jesus for three days, what's the big deal? I mean, he's the son of God. He's an all-powerful God present in our midst. Why even worry about him being lost? He can take care of himself. But Joseph and Mary were concerned. Joseph especially, because he was the guardian, the custodian of that child. He was responsible for that child. So what about a priest? What about a priest who, for some reason, has the Holy Eucharist stolen from the church? The Blessed Sacrament stolen, perhaps, from his picks that he's carrying to the sick person to give the Holy Eucharist to. Should he be concerned, oh, he's a son of God, who cares? No. The priest has responsibility, custodial rights and, and responsibilities over the Blessed Sacrament. Yes, St. Joseph would have his own seven sorrows, including the fourth sorrow, when that elderly Simeon took the divine child in his arms at that presentation in the temple and prophesied that Christ would be a sign of contradiction who would be opposed by men. And yes, the sword of sorrow may have pierced Mary's immaculate heart, but the same sword also cut and penetrated the most pure and just heart of Joseph 
at those words of Simeon. This would be the result of the incarnation of the Son of God, that he would be a divine victim. But this was not all for St. Joseph. For another prophecy predicted that his own wife would endure untold sufferings, a piercing sword as the co-redemptrix of the human race. Poor Joseph. His tender, compassionate heart would have ached at all of these prophecies being spoken in his midst too. But knowing that the blood of the Redeemer, knowing that the tears of his wife would bring about salvation to countless souls, St. Joseph experienced joy in the midst of all these sorrows. But as the mission of the redemption was about to begin, when Christ was about to enter into his public work, his ministry, all of a sudden Joseph becomes bedridden. Imagine the struggle. St. Joseph underwent as he lay dying in bed. He felt that he was a failure because he would not be the guardian of the virgin at the foot of the cross. This was his duty. And the Blessed Virgin always felt safe at Joseph's side and under his vigilant care. And so he felt as if he were somehow abandoning her at her greatest time of need. And his suffering was not just about his pain. No, it was about the pain of others. That's what hurt him, the pain of others. Think of the intimacy, the closeness of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, the head of the Holy Family, loved Jesus more than any other created person outside of Mary. And furthermore, Joseph and Mary had the deepest love that can ever be shared between a husband and a wife. And here he was, separating from them, not being able to be with them in their time of trial, what suffering our poor Joseph would have endured. It is also said by many saints that our Lord provided some revelation of just how the work of redemption was to be accomplished. Just as Abraham, the Bible says, saw our Lord's day, so did Joseph. And we can imagine what sufferings the future passion of our Lord and the sorrows of his mother brought to Joseph especially when Joseph realized he would not be there with them. Yes, Joseph's life and death are and were like a holy mass, with the passion and death of Christ being manifested in him. Realize, however, that Joseph's sacrifice was accomplished and was accompanied by daily communion with the bread of life, especially in that home at Nazareth. And good St. Joseph wants us to hunger for this union with Christ in the most blessed of all sacraments. As mentioned earlier, the Joseph of the Old Testament and the Joseph of the New Testament are very similar. The Old Testament Joseph was the keeper and distributor of grain and bread during a time of famine in Egypt. And when the people were hungry, even starving for bread, they went to Joseph, Pharaoh's right-hand man. Ite ad Joseph. Go to Joseph if you're, if you're hungry for bread. And in the New Testament, Joseph, we also see a daily communion with the bread of life. St. Joseph held in his very arms the flesh of Christ, which is real food, and the blood of Christ, which is real drink. Ite ad Joseph. Go to Joseph if you are hungry for the bread of life during a spiritual famine and receive the nourishment of his body, blood, soul, and divinity. I think most of us are familiar with the story of good St. Anthony of Padua, a great wondrous Franciscan, a great wondrous preacher, a patron to the poor, a doctor of the church, whose very tongue is incorrupt, whose tongue remains intact because it preached such wonderful words, even though he died way back in the 13th century. 
St. Anthony's sermons were so inspiring that his fame spread through all of France and Italy, especially during the last decade of his holy life. And at one time, it is said that St. Anthony brought about a wondrous miracle that defended the doctrine of the real and substantial presence of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. It is said that there was a stubborn heretic named Bonilla who mocked the most blessed sacrament, who mocked the presence of Christ's sacred body and blood in the Holy Eucharist. And he said it was no more than a fable. It was a myth, a false little story to fool the people. And no amount of teaching, no amount of words, no amount of proof and text from Scripture or tradition, nothing seemed to do any good to change this man's mind. It is said that this Bonilla challenged St. Anthony to prove this myth of the Holy Eucharist. And so he devised a contest. Bonilla would starve a donkey for three days, denying it any kind of food whatsoever. And meanwhile, St. Anthony went off to the forest where he would fast and pray also for 72 hours. They would all then return and see if the donkey would hunger for hay, for worldly food, or would hunger and adore its creator. And at the end of three days, St. Anthony returned to the town, and he went to the church where he obtained the most blessed of all sacraments. St. Anthony went into the town square where that famished donkey was. Bonilla then placed a bale of the freshest hay just a few feet away from the donkey. The donkey was then untied and began to walk towards the hay. But then it is said that St. Anthony then exposed the blessed sacrament and called to the donkey saying, Lowly beast, in the name of the Lord our God, I command you to come here and adore your creator. And all of a sudden the donkey though famished for worldly hay, reared up on its hind legs as if someone had pulled him by a bridle. The donkey then spun around and ran to St. Anthony, dropping to its forelegs with its hind legs still extended. The donkey then put its head down to the ground in a posture of adoration before the Holy Eucharist, which St. Anthony still continued to hold aloft. The heretic Bonilla was stunned at what occurred, and he begged St. Anthony for forgiveness. He converted on the spot and donated a large amount of money to build a new Catholic church. And on the cornerstone of that church building, which you can still see, Bonilla placed an engraved picture of St. Anthony holding the Holy Eucharist aloft and the donkey kneeling on its forepaws in a position of adoration before the body of Christ. A mere donkey, a beast of burden, famished, starving, utterly hungry for natural food, turned away from earthly nourishment and adored its creator. It hungered. For God, it's maker. You know, men hunger for many things. We hunger for a good meal when we're famished. Children hunger for their mom's fresh baked cookies. Some people hunger for worldly things which are not pleasing to the good Lord. Some like Esau, Jacob's brother. Some like Esau are so sensual, so gluttonous, that they would literally sell their birthright for a bowl of lentil soup. Others might hunger for fame, for popularity, for celebrity status. Some hunger for power over others. Some hunger for lustful delights. Some filled with greed hunger for more material possessions. And yet once they have actually filled themselves with the things of this world, once they have actually gorged themselves with earthly delights, they always find themselves utterly unsatisfied. Our hearts are restless until they rest in the good Lord. 
Our minds and hearts were made for the universal truth, for truth itself. Our hearts were made not just for good things, but for goodness itself. Only God can satisfy the infinite desires we have. Therefore, we could learn a lot from that donkey. Would that we could always hunger for the good Lord. To be hungry for Christ. To be hungry for truth. That we would even imitate that donkey and disdain all created things in order to adore our creator. How hungry are we for the blessed sacrament right now? Are we famished? Are we literally famished for the flesh of the Son of God? Listen to these words of a saint who was starving for the body of Christ in the Holy Eucharist. A saint who thirsted for the most precious blood. Consider the words of the great martyr and bishop of the early church, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who tradition tells us was one of the children that our Lord held in his hands when he said, let the children come to me. St. Ignatius of Antioch writes the following on his way to martyrdom. On the way to being eaten by lions and beasts, he writes this. I hunger for the bread of God, the flesh of Jesus Christ, and I long to drink his blood, the gift of unending love. St. Ignatius of Antioch continues, I no longer take pleasure in perishable food or the delights of this world. I want only God's bread which is the flesh of Jesus Christ, formed from the seed of David. And for drink, I crave his blood, which is love that cannot perish, unquote. Do we hunger, really hunger, for the Blessed Sacrament? Again, we could learn a lot from that donkey. But will we learn? How many of us are filled so much with the sensual delights of this world that our taste buds seem uninterested in supernatural food? We're dull to the taste. How many of us would be like Esau today, tomorrow, and sell our birthright? Would sell and exchange the gift of sanctifying grace in our souls for a mortally sinful action? Happens every day. We must increase our hunger for the Lord. Our longing for union with the Eucharistic Lord must increase. And St. Joseph had this daily communion with the bread of life. He was in that home of Nazareth with Our Lady. And they never tired of fellowship with the Son of God in their midst. But realize this, so very important. Christ is also hungry for you, infinitely hungry for us. He always thirsts for a union with us. He will do anything to bring us into greater union with him. Yes, it is true that we consume him in Holy Communion. We consume God in Holy Communion. But really, he consumes us. That's what's really happening. And he receives us more into union with him every time we go to communion. When I was a little child, my mom would read to me from a book. Perhaps you've read this book, kind of a weird one. It was called Where the Wild Things Are. It was by an author and illustrator known as Maurice Sendak. And in one scene, there's a young boy in the book. His name is Max, and he wants to leave his fanciful island of his dreams filled with beasts and lots of wild things, and he wants to go home because he misses his mom. But in the book, the wild things say to Max, so please don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. What a strange phrase. Don't go. We'll eat you up. We love you so. 
That's a strange thing to say. But isn't it true that parents have at times pretended to devour their children? It's a wonderful thing to see. Perhaps the little children here this evening in the pews have experienced this. And you laugh when your mother grabs you and threatens to eat you up because she loves you so much. Parents will sometimes even stuff the little feet or fists of their little ones into their mouths and they'll grin. I could just eat you up. Such acts are acts of loving affection which assured us that our parents did love us. But realize, and children sometimes forget this, our parents hungered for our love too. And if parents who are mere creatures love their children and hunger for their children's love in return, you can rest assured that our Eucharistic Lord hungers for us and he longs for us to love him. May our hunger for the Blessed Sacrament grow each day so that we may have at least a part of that intimacy which St. Joseph had daily with the bread of life. Dear people, to conclude, dear members of the mystical body of Christ, which is solely the Roman Catholic Church, our Blessed Mother, our Eucharistic Lord, and yes, good St. Joseph, they all hunger for us. They long to have a share in the fellowship that they all have with the most blessed Trinity. And yet the majority of men have no real desire for intimacy with the Holy Trinity or the Holy Family. A spiritual famine is truly present and it's afflicting our land. And people are starving. People are starving, yet they receive nothing from the officials of our nation and the officials of the church oftentimes. They receive nothing but stones for food and venom for drink. How we must attend to the message of this mission in order that relief might come that a certain age of peace might come, promised by Our Lady of Fatima, the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and a certain age of peace is a triumph of the Church, and the greatest intercessor for the Church after Our Lady is always good St. Joseph. Simply put, as I mentioned from day one of this mission, the patron of the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary is her husband, St. Joseph. And so if we honor, this is our goal here, if we honor and venerate St. Joseph more and more, Our Lady will no longer delay her triumph. So therefore, we need to learn more about good St. Joseph. And we need to honor him in a way that Mary wants us to. We need to give him the highest veneration possible we need to honor his pure and just heart. And if the membership of the church does that and exalts St. Joseph in the way that Mary wants, then we will experience restoration, renewal, and an age of peace. Heart of Jesus, I adore thee. Heart of Mary, I implore thee. Heart of Joseph, pure and just. In these three hearts, I place my trust. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.